Welcome. Today we'll, we will be presenting an overview of the operations of a leveraged SBIC fund. I'm David Garagosian, Executive Vice President of PEF Services. We are a nationally recognized fund administration firm that serves the private capital fund market and is known for our specialized expertise in all aspects of SBIC fund operations, reporting, and regulatory compliance. Presenting with me today are Beth Manzi, our COO, who oversees all client fund accounting, and Ann Anquilari, the President, CEO, and co-founder of PEF Services. We've gone through the licensing process, and now we're open for business. So you have been so focused on completing the SBIC license application process, and now that you're licensed and open for business, what's really the next step? You're going to start investing in eligible portfolio companies, keep your investors happy, keep SBA even happier, make sure your systems and processes are ready to handle all of the above. The path to success does not have to be trial and error. We'll show you some simple planning steps to get you moving quickly towards success. What we call your final checklist of to-do items is the deal team. They should be very well versed in the requirements of the eligibility of prospective portfolio companies, both in size standards and deal structure. I just want to, this is Anne, I just want to jump in, David. I think what's critical here is Many of the deal team have been down to the SBA's regs class, but that occurs prior to them actually having a deal in hand. So as you're getting closer and closer to funding a deal, really being able to walk your deal team through an actual in-house deal, pointing out where some of the restrictions might apply is very helpful to the team. I couldn't agree more. In addition to the deal team being prepped and ready to uh, start looking at the eligibility, you also have to build out and address your administrative and reporting needs. You may build your team internally or outsource to experienced professionals like PEF on the fund and compliance side. There are systems, there's accounting, reporting, communications. Everything is critical to successfully launching your fund, and often there are demands placed upon you by the LPs, especially in the areas of communications. In this process, we always recommend selecting the right partners for your needs. That's in the area of legal, audit, and fund administration. Turning to managing your capital and SBA leverage, capital calls, of course, is where you're drawing money down from your institutional and private investors. SBA is the leverage side. Getting your initial commitment of SBA leverage approved at licensing is key. And I'd like to actually introduce Beth Manzi here to talk on a few points with regards to how we work with our clients during the onboarding process. Beth? Thank you, David. Yeah, we spend a lot of time on the onboarding calls, going over the timing of capital calls and leverage draws, and there's a set calendar for the leverage draws of the first and third Wednesday of each month. So we really have to work around that timeline to lay in the capital calls and then lay in the deal pipeline to see when they think the investments are going to hit to try and plan out a calendar. So there's definitely a lot of planning that goes into getting access to that capital to fund the deals. Well, thank you. Continuing on capital and leverage access, in the area of doing the capital calls, which is where most private funds have most familiarity, the capital call timing takes, according to the limited partnership agreement, seven to 10 days. That doesn't include also the planning and actually executing the capital call itself. So while you're doing that and you're looking to maybe access SBA leverage from that process uh, during that time, keep in mind that SBA's leverage is not truly just in time. They offer twice monthly applications, which require detailed documentation, uh, a full week turnaround after the application has been accepted by SBA. So there's a lot of planning that has to go on before that leverage can be accessed. So what happens when that doesn't work for you? More recently, the lines of credit, or what we call the capital call line, has been the most successful tool in managing timing and access to dollars to fund deals. This is an, 
well, I'll call it an industry standard that's currently used by active SPIC funds, where the unfunded capital serves as sufficient collateral for experienced banks to provide a credit line. Yes, Beth? Yeah, and even with the lines of credit, it's still challenging because a lot of them have provisions where you need to execute a capital call or a leverage draw within a certain amount of days to repay the line of credit. They're truly short-term lines of credit, usually 30, you know, maybe 60 days. So they definitely help facilitate um, administratively funding the deals, but, you know, it adds an extra complexity in that you still have to do the capital calls and the leverage draws to pay back the line of credit. No, agreed, but what, what it does help is obviously funding the deals while the capital call may be in process, and That's then right. the SBA leverage can then be used to repay that bank line once it's been approved. Anne? Another point of note is if you do end up calling capital for a deal, and for whatever reason that deal doesn't happen, because of the SBA's uh, restriction on distributions, you can't turn around and repay that capital. So that's another benefit of having a line of credit as opposed to actually uh, doing a capital call. No, absolutely. It's a very, very important point. And just one thing that we do like to emphasize here, there are restrictions on lines of credits that are used, and SBA is adverse and does not allow currently uh, any lines of credit to be secured by the assets, i.e. the investments of the fund itself. Back on to investments for uh, a couple of slides here. In the due diligence and qualification area, just please understand that the size standards for eligibility have increased recently, but still, the net income is, can be no greater than 6.5 million averaged over the past two years, and tangible net worth could be no greater than 19.5 million for the most current year in period. David, I uh, just wanted to point out that under tangible, currently the SBA only recognizes excluding goodwill, not that, all intangible assets. That's correct. That's a very important point. Outside of the income and net worth test, you can also look to the size standards, uh, which are governed by the NAIX industry code, and that's in SBA regulation CFR 121. And this test can be looked at either on an employee-based or revenue-based level, and it varies significantly between industry and industry subsector. But it is uh, always a good thing to review both sides of this to look for whether or not a deal fits into the SBA for compliance purposes. And then just be aware of prohibited types of investments, project financing, investing into industries that could be contrary to the public interest. And David, just to point out, Beth's group gets a few questions a year as to what does that mean, contrary to the public interest. And that's a concept that has been in the program since before you were even involved with the program, David. And it has evolved over time. So what might have been considered contrary to the public interest 20 years ago is clear sailing today. That's true. That's true. But it's always important to ask. And again, ask your network, ask your providers, ask your legal counsel, ask SBA. They'll tell you what, whether or not it's in the public interest or not. Conflicts of interest, of course, are prohibited without SBA prior approval under certain types of conditions. And real estate development is not uh, allowed either. Beth? Yeah, and this is another area where we spend a lot of time on the onboarding and really on an ongoing basis. And we encourage our clients to call us to go over details of upcoming deals to make sure that they fit within the program rather than make the investment and then have SBA come in and look at it and you know have to divest of that um, portfolio company at a later date. No, so it's, it's it, it keeps true. you in good standing with SBA to make sure that your investments are always in compliance. Exactly. And my takeaway from this is the bottom line. Read the regulations, develop your checklist, and work with experts in this area. Closing the deal and reporting the requirements. Now that you've got your investments are qualified and you're closing the deal, there's another area that I would like Beth to talk about here, which gets into the timing on reporting. So Beth, could you uh, sure. take a minute and just run us through? Sure. 
uh, after th within 30 days of financing the deal, you'll have to file Form 1031. That form needs to be filed in the SBIC web reporting application. And it's, it was introduced last year. Um, it's still a very cumbersome and manual program. There's a lot of manual inputs. There's a lot of different screens that you have to input information on in order to get the Form 1031 and even more information for the quarterly 468, which we'll talk about later. So when you do get licensed, you'll get credentials for the system. You can have up to four users. If you have an outsourced service provider, we recommend that you have two for the service provider and two internally in case you need it. Um, if you work with us at PEF, hopefully you will never have to use it because we have our PFO reporting web application, and that is your user interface. It's a more user-friendly application and we can take the information there and transfer it into the web and prepare the Form 1031 and other reports for you. Beth, could you give us uh, some thoughts on the financial reporting requirements? Sure, the, the reporting deadline, the quarterly deadline for SBICs is not the norm in the industry for private equity. The Form 468 is due quarterly within 30 days. So it is very challenging, especially when funds are doing valuations, to try and turn this around in, in 30 days. Um, but we work with our clients to make sure all the other information is updated pending valuations. And then usually in the last um, 10 days, we, they finalize the valuations and we can um, turn that report around quickly. The valuations at least are only required semi-annually, so you have two quarter break from that, so you can turn it around more quickly than that. Um, but that must also be submitted through the SBIC web. Uh, those, it's basic financial statement information, balance sheet income statement, P&L and so forth, investment schedule, just in a different format. And it needs to be reported, as I said, through the SBIC web, submitted electronically. And the financial statements are on the, using SBA accounting guidelines rather than U.S. GAAP. Um, the majority of the accounting policies are the same, but there are differences when you get to valuation and some of the other items that we'll talk about later. The financial statement reports to the limited partners usually are sent out about 45 to 60 days after quarter end, so you have a little bit more time there depending on your LPA. And most of those are reported to the investors using gap reporting. And it's really important to be able to deliver that information securely. Uh, we use an, our own proprietary web application investor library. And we'll post the reports. Each investor can log in and get fund information, their particular information, their capital count statements. We use it for capital calls and all the other partner correspondence as well. And it's a secure website. We can deliver K-1s through the website and any other uh, limited partner reports that you have. But it's important to have a secure method of communication like that with your partners. I just wanted to add a point on the Form 468. A few yes. years ago, the SBA uh, implemented a requirement for reporting portfolio company financials quarterly. And we were able to roll this out in our system so we could collect the information directly from the portfolio companies or the uh, fund management uh, fund manager uh, people but it does require a fair amount of effort to make sure you can have timely information reported to the SBA they do monitor whether or not the information that you're submitting is timely um, and you also have to make sure that there's an understanding by your portfolio company that you will be asking for. Obviously, you're going to get the financials, but there's also additional information that the SBA requires to be reported on from the portfolio company. Many funds use a very standard side letter as part of their deal documents to ensure compliance with access to that information. Okay, thank you, Anne. And the cycle continues. Deal sourcing, capital calls, SBA leverage draw, deal closings. And then, of course, there's a cap on leverage, just as you've got your fund ramped up. Uh, Beth, could you describe what we've seen with regards to our clients and how we try to help them manage the process? Here? Sure. 
The um, once you start having deals on the books, uh, and again you're using up your leverage, you're you're capped at a half tier of le regulatory capital until you have your first SBA exam. So, as soon as you put your first deal on the books, we encourage you to reach out to your SBA analyst and get that exam scheduled, so that you'll have access to the other tier of regulatory capital um, available in your commitment that you were approved for. And then it's just really managing the process going forward. We're always checking in with clients on their leverage availability versus, you know, their capital calls and when it's time to apply for their second tier of commitment. Okay. So we had mentioned examinations while we were talking about leverage availability and the cap. And when you're planning, when you're you are planning for the examination the whole time that you're open for business. SBA will schedule an exam for you if you're leveraged on an annual basis the entire time that you are in the SBIC program. But the first one is critical. And when you're moving or transferring from licensing into the Office of Operations, you're going to be working with a brand new level of staff. So we always try to encourage you, if possible, to schedule a meeting in DC with your new analyst and area chief, review your business plan and deal pipeline, and ask them to get on the exam schedule so that they know that you are out there and you don't get lost in the shuffle. Examinations are not audits, but they do require significant financial data to be made available. The focus, as listed here, is really on these following areas. The eligibility of the portfolio company, size and industry. The deal structure itself, to make sure it's regulatorily compliant. Cost of money, which is effectively the interest rate and other fees charged. Uh, who receives the fees? The funder of the management company. Management fee calculations, fees and offsets. They're tracking the cash and the transactions of the funds uh, throughout the process. And once you're through the examination process, you're going to be eligible to access the remainder of the leverage that you have available to you with that full expectation that from SBA that you're operating the fund and investing in a manner that was presented both in the license application and in those updates that you'll be providing them that we recommend you know, through meetings with SBA. And of course, you must always be fully regulatory compliant. Beth, could you just speak uh, quickly on the audit side? Because we're almost through the year in the life of a general partner here, mm -hmm. and it's time for the audit. Right. So, so the, audit, the important part to remember about the audit is it doesn't start after year end. It actually starts before year end with the interim work and planning. Uh, we usually get involved with our clients' audits and, you know, schedule a kickoff call with the auditors, the clients, and us all on the phone. So we're all on the same page as far as who's going to provide what information, what information is required, and then the timing. So that usually starts around September, October, November, depending on the size and complexity of the fund. And the auditors try and get through ev all the transactions at least through September 30th of the current year so that the year-end cycle goes quicker. Um, all throughout the year as transactions are coming up that are questionable or that the auditors might have difficulty understanding. We encourage clients to talk to their auditors on a real-time basis about those transactions so that it doesn't come up in March when, you know, everybody's expecting them to sign the opinion. Um, some funds do require two audits, one on an SBA basis for Form 468, which goes to the SBA and one on a gap basis that'll go out to the investors. So the auditors will actually issue two audit opinions. Um, the limited partner concerns, they're, you know, they're definitely looking at valuations. That's you know, definitely one of the most important items in the audit. Uh, but you're gonna find that your limited partners are gonna also have special requests for information, especially the larger institutional investors. They're gonna want more transparency. Uh, we see a lot of different um, you know, industry groups putting out templates for information. Um, ILPA has a, has a few. And some partners have their own templates of information that they want on a regular basis. So it's nice to get out in front of those rather than have people call you after the fact to put together the information. So as a silver lining to being an SBIC fund and required to collect a lot more information than a non-SBIC fund is that you will be better equipped to satisfy the information requests coming from your institutional investors. That's a very good point, Anne. 
And that brings us basically to the summary and conclusion of our presentation. It takes diligence, oversight, communication, selection of the right partners to manage an SBIC fund. Success should be defined as a combination of all of the above. If you remember these steps and implement them, we hope that this will help you navigate the SBIC regulatory and operational environment for this fund and keep you on the path of success for your next fund. We want to thank you for spending time with us today. Uh, if you have any questions, all of us, myself, David, Beth, Manzi, and Ann Aquilari are available. Our contact information is listed in the presentation. Thank you very much.